the threat landscape is changing rapidly, but at the same time the weaknesses of an IT infrastructure that are exploited by hackers to get in, as well as the attack lifecycle, so kind of the methodology used by the hacker, are actually mostly the same. So in this video we will have a quick look at these weaknesses and then I will show you step by step a real life case on how easy it is to infiltrate an enterprise network. If this is your first time here, I'm Lars von Consigas. We call ourselves the Palo Alto Networks Experts because the next generation firewall is our passion. It's what we do all day every day, migrating firewalls, providing managed services and most important, implementing security best practices. When I started to work with this box in 2010, barely anyone knew about Palo Alto Networks. But as an engineer I felt that this solution will change the world of cybersecurity. And yes, today we know it did big time, because it's one of the few security solutions that can truly secure your network. However, there's a caveat. You need to set it up in the right way in order to be effective. Because while it's awesome, it's not a magic box. So over the years we became a professional service partner for Palo Alto Networks, as well as one of a few elite authorized training centers. And was working in the field for so many years and being a trainer, I would like to share my experience with you. So over the next couple of weeks and months, we release new videos and core concepts explaining the fundamental workings of the next generation firewall, starting with the trend landscape, then deployment methods, NAT, AppID, SSL decryption, VPNs, and many more. So follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter to stay up to date. But now let's have a look how a device gets compromised. First of all, the thing what we need to distinguish is uh, kind of servers where are end user devices. Right. And um, if we look at our data center, the data, our data center is always special because here we run a service, like a web page, for instance. Right. And now this means that the user, and it doesn't really matter if the user is inside of the network or in the internet, can send data to your application, which has to be processed by your application. And and that's this is important, right? Because um, it means that. You know, if a hacker finds out about a bug in your software, right, he knows a vulnerability which can be exploited and he can send data to your application, right, the application processes it, and now with processing the data, there's kind of then a malfunction, the exploit, right, and now the hacker effectively gets your piece of software in your data center to do something which was not originally intended or programmed to do. Right, so and that's kind of the the exploit and the risk for an exploit in the data center we will always have, right? Because as long as we're gonna have software, we're gonna have software bugs, and some of these bugs are exploitable uh, by hackers. Okay, so that's kind of the specific risk of a data center hosting a service. The end user device or a device operated by an end user is different because in most cases it doesn't really run a service, right? So here what a hacker has to do is actually trick the user to initiate a communication to the hacker. Now, sounds complicated, but obviously we know with social engineering this is always possible. And this is something where I often see IT people making their life a little bit too easy, right? Just blaming the user. Oh, stupid user, how could he have clicked on the link? Why did he open this file? It's obvious, right? Now, it's not that easy, right? Because we have to realize that social engineering attacks these days really use the techniques out of psychology. Take this example, for instance, okay? So put yourself into the shoes of an accountant, okay? So as an accountant, it's a day-by-day -day work that you receive such a payment advice, right? So you kind of, you deal with this. And now the hacker, what he does, first of all, he creates a situation of uncertainty. You receive the email, use a bit of a strange invoice format, what you're not aware of, the company you don't know, right? Um, but now you're an accountant, right? You have financial responsibility to deal with this. You cannot just ignore it, right? And now comes something into play, what in psychology they call the need for closure, right? You're a busy accountant, you know, uh, you need to, you know, you cannot just ignore it. You want to close the matter. What's, what do you do? Well, I can call IT, but they're really slow, right? Um, and you know, I'm busy, I want to just get, get it done. So let's just open the file, what can happen, right? So we open the file, and then there's a message, sensitive content hidden for security reason, click to enable. How we click, right, and boom, obviously macro kicks in and infects the PC with malware, okay? Now, um, <clears throat> if you take the example of RSA, you know RSA, these, uh, you know, the big security company um, with these security dual factor authentication tokens. Um, they are one of the biggest security company in the world, and they 
their, their kind of intellectual property got stolen because one contractor opened up an email which was correctly put into the anti-spam folder. Now, it's very easy to blame this guy, right? But if from a big company, data gets stolen because one guy opened up an email, something else must be wrong, right? And this is what, what, what we have to realize, right? In a tech these days, it's not just one thing. It's a step-by-step -step process, right? The hacker has to go through multiple steps successfully, right? In order to kind of uh, to put actions on its objective at the end, right? To compromise or do whatever he wants to do, right? So now uh, Lockheed Martin coined the, f kind of the phrase kill chain, cyber kill chain, right? We talk about, you know, cyber attack life cycle, but the name doesn't really matter, right? The important thing here is to realize it's a chain of events, right? Means the user is only one single element of it, right? And there are loads of other opportunities that we have as IT security to basically stop, stop the attack, okay? So now I'm going to go through an example. Um, and I kind of use a specific example where actually the, the attack was done through an end user device, simply because the end user device in most cases is also the entrance actually then to your data center. Okay. Now, in this specific example, there was a user going to a news web page, right? Uh, was kind of actually in a real example from, from a customer what we had um, some time ago. And here we can say this was legitimate traffic, right? Because news is usually allowed by most companies. But now, uh, as part of the web page, there was advertisement, and as part of his advertisement, the user downloaded uh, a flash file. So flash isn't something unusual, but this was a malicious flash file which now exploited a vulnerability on the user's PC, which then in the background, without the user's knowledge, instructed the PC to go out to the internet and download another executable, a malicious executable file. Okay, so these two steps, they're really important. So let's go back and look at them again. Okay, so first of all, um, the hacker now here uses this flash file. The flash file, very important, it's a data file. It's a data file like a PDF, like a Word document, and it means that it was a data file, it cannot run on its own. It always needs an existing piece of software on the user's machine uh, which, which can be opened. And uh, hackers like to use data files because, guess what, we can't really block them, right? You, you cannot block PDF flash. I mean, okay, there are some security practitioners out there who tell you, oh yeah, block flash, it's really insecure. These are the same people who told you five years ago you have to block Java, right? But guess what? As long as we're gonna have software which has a lot of functionality, the software as such has a high threat surface, right? And will always have bugs which are exploitable. Okay, so this is something that is not gonna go away. Right. So, and again, for hackers, these data files are very kind of attractive because once they find a vulnerability in, this, in these softwares, it's kind of pretty easy for them now to get uh, files into the company like this. Okay. So now, the PC kind of gets exploited. Now you might ask, okay, why does he now need to go out to the internet to download another executable? Right. He already was successfully exploiting this vulnerability. Yes. Right. But an exploit always has limits. Right. Um, remember, it's called APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. Right. And hacker always tries to tries to gain persistence on a PC. And the problem with an exploit is an exploit in most cases is very noisy. Right. When you run and when you kind of exploit a vulnerability of a piece of software, usually the software is crashing. Right. So create a lot of noise. Right. And kind of logs and everything. Not really good for persistence. Okay. At the same time, it's also limited in functionality. Right. With an exploit, you cannot do everything. There are some exploits where you can get even kind of uh, shell access to a device, and that that's pretty pretty cool. Right. Uh, but it's still limited. Right. Because you cannot do advanced stuff like key logging, for instance. Okay. So, I mean, for the hacker to do everything he wants to do, in most cases, right, the flash, the exploit is only kind of a middle step, right, to then instruct the device to go out to the internet, download another executable file, and this malicious executable, this is now the real malware, right, taking full control of the PC, okay? This is now also the first step where, in theory, antivirus should block the attack, but antivirus, these days, doesn't, you know, isn't really working anymore, simply because um, antivirus only blocks known threats or known malware, okay? So now, known is def defined based on a signature and you know changing a signature of a file is very simple, right? Hackers use crypto, for instance, to re-encrypt files, right? It can be go to a stage where every time you download the file, it's getting re-encrypted and with this, every time you download, it has a new signature, right? So there's kind of this methodology of antivirus to block what we already know is bad, it simply does not work, okay? 
Um, so with this, you know, the malware goes onto the PC. So and now it is, um, you know, taking control. Uh, first thing, usually what malware has is something what we call a rootkit, where the malware embeds itself very deeply into the operating system. Um, and with this, you know, if you later on as an admin look onto the PC, you're not going to see any logs, no services, no nothing. Okay, so it's really completely uh, stealthy. Okay, so with this also, if your antivirus maybe gets updated, so let's say you know you have a new attack, and then I don't know your antivirus company tells you, oh yeah yeah we we uh, blocked this attack, right? We blocked this malware, right? Um, but they did not block it when it came out. So let's say maybe they blocked it a day after, right? But if you're already infected, then the antivirus software will still not find it because now the malware is already kind of embedded into the system, right? So it's kind of useless, okay? That's why, by the way, when we see cases where PCs got infected with malware, we always tell customers, re-image the PC, right? And even with re-imaging, sometimes you have to be careful, okay? Good. Anyway, so now we're at a stage where a device is infected with malware, okay? But that's not the end of the world, right? Uh, it's kind of halfway through the attack. Um, Halfway because you know this infection can happen in numerous other ways, maybe through email, through USB sticks, or whatever. Okay, but we have now a malware infected machine inside of the network, which again is not the end of the world, right? And because now uh, what the malware tries to do is establish a command and control channel to the kind of hacker's command and control server, meaning now the hacker, you know wants to get a communication channel to the malware infected PC to get control of it, to then basically instruct it to whatever he wants it to do. Okay, so here now the hacker has a couple of challenges. First of all, there are some security products in place, like maybe firewall and a proxy, right? But then first of all, um, the malware infected PC needs to know the IP address of its command and control server. And obviously this IP address is changing all the time because, you know, servers are taken down by law enforcement uh, or for whatever reason, right? And hackers are pretty clever here to kind of really build big peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, of a kind of really command and control infrastructure, which is really difficult to take down. So even law enforcement has uh, really challenges with this sometimes, right? But the challenges uh, for the hacker exists still that the malware infected PC needs to know at least the first IP address of the first live command and control server. And for this, hackers usually use DNS, okay? So with this, you know, they, for instance, include an algorithm into the malware, and based on this algorithm, the hacker knows that tomorrow, the malware infected PC will try to resolve a DNS entry like beefbread.com, just as an example, okay? Good. Okay, so what happens? Well, malware infected PC is going to send a DNS query to your DNS server. DNS server sends it out to the internet. Guess what? DNS server doesn't have any security, firewall. Oh, I see a DNS request. Of course, the firewall lets it go through, right? So with this now, the response is coming back. And now very valuable detail is on, on the malware infected PC. You know, it's the IP address. So now let's say this is a secure network. All communication has to go to the company's proxy. Okay, so the you know a request is now sent to the proxy server, but instead of using the domain, the malware now uses the IP address, so kind of like an IP domain. Okay, so it sends a request like this to the proxy. So first of all, it's HTTPS, right? Uh, so it's encrypted, um, and even if it's kind of decrypted, then the the proxy sees the the URL, uh, the domain. It's an IP domain. A lot of legitimate applications use IP domains, so that's not something special, right? Maybe the proxy has antivirus, but that's not a virus. Uh, even a very sophisticated IPS system would have tricky kind of had trouble uh, identifying this because a query like this, like here, search, question mark, and a kind of a long hash behind it, a lot of legitimate applications use this as well, okay? So with this, you know, the message goes to the command control server, and now we have a perfectly nice communication channel uh, established through all of the kind of you know common uh, security elements uh, what what a company has right so firewall proxy antivirus all the stuff is there but unfortunately pretty useless against this attack and by the way if you're interested in security best practices for Palo Alto networks then check out the blog on our webpage here in the best practice section you can download this worksheet with over 120 best practices for the next generation firewall and very soon, we will also launch a security best practice training with a lot of videos explaining all of these security best practices in detail. So if you're interested, then sign up to our mailing list and we will let you know as soon as this free training is available.